The church is the called out body of believers who belong to the Lord. We endeavor to live out our faith in the context of community. We know we're not perfect, but we focus on Jesus Christ and the redemption we have received through His sacrifice for us. Our hope is rooted in Him, and we trust that He will come again to glorify His people. We are committed to worshiping God, studying Scripture, sincere prayer, and filling our hearts with compassion. We are the church. Welcome to our online worship coming to you from Temple, Texas, the Church of Christ that meets at Northside. We're happy to have you with us. As we prepare to start our worship this morning, I thought I would share a passage from Psalm 103 and then an opening prayer. In Psalm 103 we read, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. As we prepare to worship, let's remember to praise God with all of our soul, with all of our might. Would you bow with me? Our awesome God in heaven, we come humbly before your throne, recognizing your power and your greatness. We do truly want to give our lives completely to you in all that we say and do. As we offer our worship and praise to you, we pray that it is pleasing to you and that we continue to offer our worship and praise to you every day of our lives. We thank you for hearing us, making us your children, for redeeming us, for forgiving our, our sins. It's in your Son's blessed name we pray. Amen. You were despised, you were rejected, Lord, those who passed by, even averted their gaze from the side. Such was the suffering you bore for us. Father, you spoke not a word, but 
chose to be silent, though you did no wrong, nor was deceitfulness found in you. Yet by your wounds our salvation has come, yet by your suffering our freedom is won. For God has highly exalted your name, Christ alone. 
Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the blessings that you provide to us. We thank you for uh, life and health. Uh, we thank you for food. We thank you for the shelter that we have. Uh, we don't all enjoy these things in equal portions, but we all uh, have many blessings that we can count uh, and that we can uh, give you the glory for. And we pray, dear Lord, uh, that we would always be grateful, that we would always be uh, willing to acknowledge and glorify you for the blessings that we have. But more than our physical blessings, Lord, I thank you for uh, the spiritual blessings. Thank you for your word. Uh, we pray that we won't be neglectful to read it and to study it. Thank you for the avenue of prayer where we can come to you and, uh, and unburden ourselves and give you the glory and the praise uh, and uh, ask for supplication for those things that uh, are on our hearts and confess our wrongs and we do that Lord we confess to you that we fall short and we sin and we just ask your forgiveness for those things. Um, we thank you for the spiritual blessing of Jesus and for the salvation that we can experience through him. We thank you for the opportunities that you lay before us to, to uh, share with others and to do good for others in your name. And we pray that we would not be neglectful, but that we would take those opportunities and use them to the fullest. Energize us, encourage us, uh, renew our strength, Lord, as we, as we go out this week or as we work from home. Uh, show us those things that we can do. Uh, to be ambassadors for you and for your kingdom uh, to this world. We pray these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Atonement. The righteous for the unrighteous. Good morning. I invite you to give attention to the reading of 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18. 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Let me ask you, have you ever not been paying attention? And then when you finally realize what's going on, everything suddenly clicks. I was going through a drive through a while back, and as I was ordering a chicken sandwich meal, and I said that when I pulled up, I, I want the chicken sandwich meal. She said, we are out of chicken sandwiches. I did not hear her say that. I went on, I want a Diet Coke, I want fries with that, and I want the fruit cup. And then I said, I want the barbecue, and I, and I started asking for the kind of sauce that I wanted to go with the chicken sandwich. She said, well, that's great. What do you want in place of the chicken sandwich? And I said, I wanted the chicken sandwich meal. <laughs> the confusion continued because she then said, well, you know, our truck got delayed and the reason is because it, it got caught up and then she named a town. And as I was listening to her, it finally clicked. It finally dawned on me. So I said, oh, you're out of chicken sandwiches. And she said, she was very gracious, she said, yes, sir, we're out of chicken sandwiches. I said, so I'll take a cheeseburger. Sometimes we don't pay attention and can miss very crucial details when it comes to the teaching of the Bible about atonement. We had better take care we don't miss hearing this important detail about Christianity. If we miss the Bible's teaching on the atonement, then we miss the gospel. If we fail to learn the details of this doctrine, we cannot grasp, we cannot understand Christianity. 
If we don't understand the teaching that Peter is speaking of here, this teaching about the exchange which transpired at the cross of the righteous for the unrighteous, then our faith is going to be hollow and won't hold up under pressure. Sometimes we forget things we should know. Sometimes we get distracted from things we should remember. We need to make sure that we appreciate the value of this powerful teaching. So let's think about this text. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that He might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. In the context, the verses that come prior to verse 18, the Apostle Peter is pointing to Jesus and reminding us of the hope that we have in Him. Now, by the way, that's Peter's theme. The theme of 1 Peter is hope. We have an authentic and durable hope as Christians. The believers at the time of Peter's writing are suffering persecution. They are having to endure hardship as they face trials and difficulties of a variety of sorts. And Peter's message to them is that even in the midst of suffering, even as you are walking through trials, even if you are facing difficulties, you still have Christian hope. And no one can take that from you. The confident grounding of our faith is hope. Hope that because of what Jesus did at the cross, we can be sure that our sins have been cleansed because Christ did His work well. Therefore, we can face sufferings. We can face hardship. We can face challenges in this life because we see the big the big picture. And even when circumstances are rough, even when experiences in life may be very difficult, that hope never changes. Our Christian hope doesn't ebb and flow depending on how our day is going. Our hope is always there. We have an unshakable underpinning for our faith. And yes, we're going to have tough times and we're going to have difficulties, but we always have that bedrock foundation of faith. We always have that hope. And so Peter says in verse 17, it's better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will than for doing evil. And so you can face hardship and come out whole on the other side. You can weather the storms and still be afloat when the sky is clear. And then in verse 18, again, we're in 1 Peter chapter 3, he elevates the discussion to the topic of atonement. Peter moves from just talking about enduring suffering, our suffering through the trials and persecutions, or the ridicule that, that those Christians were facing. Undoubtedly, they had neighbors, they had community members, they had peers that were t trying to, to call them back to their pre-Christian life. And, and they're being challenged. Am I going to hold on to my faith? And am I going to continue to embrace these convictions? Am I going to persevere in my belief in Christ? Or am I just going to go back in step with the world and surrender to the ideas engulfing me by a non-Christian culture? In order to encourage them, Peter escalates it from us and our suffering, the original readers and their suffering, and now he's going to point to Christ. He's going to say, okay, let's stop thinking for a moment about our suffering and let's be reminded of what Jesus has done. And so he says, for Christ also suffered. We face suffering, but now it's escalated. Don't forget the suffering that Christ endured. Christ also suffered. 
He bore our sin. He became at the cross the sin bearer. Here's the phrase, the righteous for the unrighteous. He bore our sins, the sins of humanity. You know, let me make an aside for just a moment. For us to, to really appreciate the beautiful doctrine of atonement, we must first appreciate the heinousness of sin. We too often laugh off sin or minimize it. The world mocks sin and says it's no big deal to flaunt immorality. After all, I'm, I'm pretty happy in my sin and, and seem to be feeling no ill effects. But the truth is, your sin will drag you eternally into the abyss of hell. Let's just suppose, pretend with me for the purpose of illustration, you, you committed a crime here in the United States and were sought by the authorities. Just pretend that you decided to flee to uh, another country, just say Switzerland. You may feel safe in Switzerland. You may enjoy the mountains and the chocolate and feel that all is well. But the moment you try to re-enter the United States, you'll be met at the airport by the authorities and be told, hey, we have some issues here. You may feel that all is well. And you may be quite adept at running from your sin. But the moment you die, you will arrive into the presence of God. And He may say, we have some issues we need to address. And you have punishment that has come due. If you're a criminal on the run, you will be extradited when you die. And sin makes a criminal of us all. Jesus didn't die for His sins. No, Jesus was pure. He was perfect. However, He took our place. That's the sense of substitutionary atonement. He paid the price to justify us from our sin. The righteous, that is Jesus, for the unrighteous. That's you and me. In order that, there's a purpose to this. That we might have relationship with God. That we might have a blessed eternal life, that sin will no longer separate, but that we can have union with our Father, that He might bring us to God. Being put to death in the flesh, that's a reference to the cross, but made alive to the Spirit, that's a reference to the resurrection. This theme of atonement is very prevalent in the Bible. The doctrine of the atonement, if we want to define it, if we, we, we could define it in this way, the atonement is the work Christ did in His life and death to earn our salvation. That's the definition. The atonement is the work Christ did in His life and death to earn our salvation. Christ atones for sin by paying the penalty of sin in His sacrifice, removing God's wrath as our propitiation, overcoming our separation from God as through reconciliation, and freeing us from the bondage of sin and Satan, and by God's grace, enabling our redemption. Now, th This is a, a top-tier teaching of the Scriptures. The doctrine of, to of atonement is a theme throughout the Bible. Take note of, of other places. The Bible highlights atonement. Let, let's do a, a quick survey. As I read these, you listen for atonement. So I'm asking you to, to fine-tune your ears and catch the message of atonement in these passages. Now, here in 1 Peter, uh, we've looked at verse 18 in chapter 3. But this is not the first time Peter points to this powerful teaching. In fact, just prior in chapter 2 and verse 24, uh, we notice, um, in, again, in 2.24, we, we notice how he highlights it in this instance. He himself, Peter is referring to Jesus, he himself 
bore our sins in his body on the tree, so that having died to sins, we might live for righteousness. Notice how the Apostle Paul speaks of atonement. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, For our sake He, that is God, made Him, that is Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. I also want to highlight a passage in Romans chapter 5. And it's a, a little bit longer of a text, but I want to read it. Romans 5, verses 6, beginning in verse 6 through verse 17, and then we'll also probably try to pick up a couple of verses after that as well. But listen as I read Romans 5, beginning in verse 6. And again, you're listening for atonement. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For rarely will someone die for a just person, though for a good person perhaps someone might even dare to die. But God proves His own love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How much more then, since we have now been declared righteous by His blood, will we be saved through Him from wrath? For if, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, then how much more, having been reconciled, will we be saved by His life? And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received this reconciliation. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, in this way death spread to all people because all sinned. In fact, sin was in the world before the law, but sin is not charged to a person's account when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who did not sin. In the likeness of Adam's transgression, he is a type of the coming one. But the gift is not like the trespass. For if by the one man's trespass the many died, how much more have the grace of God and the gift which comes through the grace of the one man Jesus Christ overflowed to the many? And the gift is not like the one man's sin, because from one sin came the judgment resulting in condemnation. But from many trespasses came the gift resulting in justification. Since by the one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, how much more will those who receive the overflow of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? This is just dripping with atonement. Paul is expounding on this teaching about the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ. And so he concludes this section with verses 18 and 19, where it says, The many are made righteous. So then, as through one trespass there is condemnation for everyone, so also through one righteous act, there is justification leading to life for everyone. For just as through one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so also through the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. The theme continues in the Bible. 1 Timothy 2, verses 3 through 6, This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave Himself as a ransom for all. In 1 John 1, 29, the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, 
Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Hebrews 9, 13 and 14, For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And then in verse 15, since a death has occurred that redeems them from transgressions. It is a major theme in the Bible. It's expressed in a variety of ways. I think of also 1 John 2 and verse 2, He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And then even in the Old Testament, we have dramatic portraits of this theme. Isaiah 53 verse 5, But He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon Him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with His wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. In Genesis chapter 22, Abraham passes the test of faith by being willing to offer up his only son to God as a sacrifice. God intervenes and provides a ram as a sacrifice instead. God spared Isaac. He intervened. He provided a substitute. But for the Son of God, there is no substitute. He indeed was the substitute for sinners. I think of Romans 8, 31 and 32. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare His own Son, but gave Him up for us all, how will He not also with Him graciously give us all things? We look at Abraham and and we see how his son was spared and, and we see his faith and we say, how he loved God. But when we see God not sparing his own son, we look at the cross and understand what was done there for me, a sinner, by a holy God who sacrificed his only son. And we say, how God loved me. For Jesus, there was no substitute. Although the God who provided one for Isaac was well able to rescue his own son from death, but the sovereign Lord of glory, in accord with redemption's story, designed Christ's death for our sake and for our salvation. And we ought to be quite overwhelmed by this. This is God the Father and God the Son united in such a love for sinners that would make the very universe tremble. That is the amazing truth about Calvary. He, that is God, did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all. Jesus took our place. He bore our sin. He did what we could not do for ourselves. The good news of Jesus Christ, a top-tier teaching of Scripture, a variety of passage, and that's just a sampling, a variety of inspired biblical writers devote much time and attention to trying to teach us this critical lesson that the good news of Jesus Christ is the story of God doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. I listened to a sermon online. It was titled Atonement. So I listened to it and I thought, well, it'll be interesting to to hear this minister's take on, on this topic. And he used an illustration in the sermon. Illustrations are good. And I, I took note of the illustration that he used. And, and let me share with you this illustration about atonement. He said, he said, I read about a small boy who was Uh, consistently late coming home from school. His parents warned him one day that uh, he must be home on time that afternoon, but nevertheless, he arrived later than ever. His mother met him at the door, 
said nothing. But at dinner that night, the boy looked at his plate and there was only a slice of bread and just a glass of water. He looked at his father's full plate and then he looked at his father, but his father remained silent. And the boy was crushed. And the father waited for the full impact to sink in and then quietly took the boy's plate, placed it in front of himself and took his own plate full of meat and potatoes and, and placed it before his son. And the boy grew up to be a man and said, All my life I've known what God is like by what my father did that night. What do you make of that illustration? It's a good story. It's sweet. It conveys a, a tender-hearted message, right? But I want to suggest, though, that it is a woefully inadequate illustration when it comes to this doctrine of atonement. You see, we're not talking about going without a meal. We're not talking about a, a rich person coming along and paying off all your debt. Oh, I have all this debt. Well, I'm going to atone for your debt. I'm going to pay it off. We're, we're not talking about someone out of their wealth paying off your debt. That's not atonement. This is you being sentenced to die. And another, though innocent, takes your place and dies instead. That's atonement. I mean, I mean we think maybe of a lawyer, a mediator, someone who comes and, and pleads your case, but then when you're found guilty, it's unheard of that the lawyer would then go beyond his duty of, of being an advocate and becomes a propitiation. That's the term in the New Testament. It's difficult to really translate. It's atoning sacrifice. And as if this lawyer says, okay, well, I will be executed for this man's crime and he will go free. What lawyer does that? But atonement means we were dead and lost. We are fundamentally needy. Now, we don't like to hear that, but that's the gospel. The gospel says first, first, it, it points to a loving and gracious God, and it tells of a terrible need that we are flawed and broken. And it gets worse because we cannot save ourselves, no matter how many good deeds we accumulate, no matter how much we obey, no matter the checklist that we work through, we can never do enough good stuff. We can never be a good enough person to save ourselves. In fact, God pe uh, good people, good people are not going to make it to heaven. Forgiven people are going to make it to heaven. People whose sins have been atoned for by another that's the gospel. Again, if we don't get atonement, we don't get the gospel. We don't get Christianity. And sometimes we think, well, I'm good enough and, and I can do this. And, and we're tempted to compare our self-righteousness against others around us and think, you, you know, I'm better than, than the guy down the road that drinks too much and is harsh to his kids. And I'm better than the people that are in prison. I think I'm, I'm good enough that when I die or when Jesus comes back, then He's going to, to let me in. I think I'm just good enough. I'm not perfect. But on this scale of righteousness kind of thing, you know, it, I'm, I'm not as bad as all those other bad people. And so I think I'm good enough that God is going to let me in. With believers, sometimes we hear, well, you know, I just think that if I do my part and if I'm good enough and when I die, then I surely think maybe, perhaps, hopefully, He'll let me into heaven. God's grace is a message that we have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And obedience is important. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. 
But obedience follows grace. And the gospel begins with the grace of God that we are saved not by merit, not by our works, not because we are a superstar or even how much we go to church or study Scripture. It's not that we're saved because we have, a, we have certain good qualities about us that, that God just can't help but take note of. We are saved because God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Whoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. And that's a gift. We don't earn our salvation. A works-based salvation, a works-based redemption model is woefully and thoroughly inadequate to provide the kind of hope that Peter is wanting to point us to here in this epistle. That's why he reminds us of Jesus and the atoning sacrifice of Jesus Christ and what Jesus did, because we couldn't do that. We are entirely dependent on another to act for our good. And the one who acted for our good is Jesus Christ. He was the only one qualified. He was the only one able. He was the only one who could bear your sin and my sin. And our response is trust in Him and faith in Him. And certainly obedience outflows from that and service and devotion and conviction, yes. But we are saved by grace through faith, and this is not our own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works. We have to get this right in our thinking about Christianity. Because I believe, unfortunately, one of the most uh, popular ideas about Christianity is that it is simply this nebulous kind of lifestyle a person may choose to adopt in order to provide an emotionally therapeutic self-validation. I feel good about myself when I go to church and when I pray from time to time. And it's a feeling of self-validation that I seek and in order so that I can feel good about myself. However, true Christianity is not self-centered in nature, but entirely God-centered. And our faith must begin with an acknowledgement that through Christ, a great deed has been done for me that I could not do for myself. And the good news is that Jesus died for me. Again, not someone paying off your car loan or sharing an evening meal, but because of sin, we were doomed. We deserved death. We were enemies of God, aligned against His righteousness. And thus, we were rightly recipients of God's wrath. But Jesus stepped in. And He bore that in our place. He took our sin. He died for me. He died for you. Someone has died in your place. And it was an innocent one that has taken your sin, and by His stripes we are healed. Sometimes, when we're not paying close attention, we miss things that are really important. And when we realize what's going on, Sometimes everything just clicks. Maybe for you this morning, something needs to click. Maybe you're realizing for the first time that Jesus died in your place on the cross, the righteous for the unrighteous. He died for you. Don't you want to live for Him? Before Peter can talk about the great hope that we have, he knows that we need to be reminded of the great atonement that has been accomplished on our behalf. If you are not a Christian, then this is a critical lesson. This is a vital message. When Peter says that Christ suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, he's saying that you need a Savior, and not just anyone will do. Jesus Christ alone can save. Put your faith in Him. 
Trust in Him. Repent of sin. Confess His name. Put Him on in the waters of baptism, and by His blood you can be cleansed. For those of us that are Christians, let this be a reminder to make sure we never forget the importance of atonement. Let this motivate us to serve. Let the blessing of Christ's atonement for us propel us into more sincere ministry. Sometimes I think our, our efforts are lackluster. Our conviction is crippled. Our faith is feeble. Our hope is anemic. Not because we deny God's existence, but because we perhaps forget or we think too little of the great atonement that has been accomplished on our behalf. Jesus died for us. He is our sin bearer. He gloriously rose from the grave and pioneered that path through death that we too will someday walk. The righteous paid the price for the unrighteous. Remember that the atonement of Jesus Christ is the grounding of our hope. What Jesus did for us in the past has relevance to us in our life today, and it assures us of a glorious future when He comes again. If you have a, a spiritual need, reach out to us and let us connect you with Jesus Christ. He can save you. Will you join your heart with me in prayer? Almighty God, we are so thankful for the atoning sacrifice of Jesus for our sake. He bore our sins, and because of that we have forgiveness, and we have hope, and we have a wonderful promise of a blessed eternal life with You. We are thankful for Your love and grace. We are thankful for the sacrifice of Jesus. We're thankful for the power of the Spirit. And Lord, please help us as your people to live lives that honor you, that reflect the fact that we have been so wonderfully redeemed. We thank you. We ask for your blessing upon us, that you will encourage and comfort us, that you will give us strength and wisdom and greater portions of your peace. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're coming together at this time to remember our Lord and His willingness to come to this earth, to sacrifice Himself on the cross for our sins. This morning we will recognize that sacrifice through observing the bread, which represents His body, and through partaking of the fruit of the vine, which represents the blood that He shed for our sins. Let us now go to our Father in prayer as we begin to partake of the bread. Father God, we're so thankful for the blessing of your Son, His willingness, His submission to your will to go up on the cross on our behalf, to resolve us of our sins and carry those on His shoulders. Father, as we partake of this bread, we do so to glorify Him and His sacrifice and the salvation that He has provided to us. And it's his name we pray. Amen. Now let us give thanks for the fruit of the vine. Father, again, as we approach your throne, we're so thankful and so blessed for your, the, for your son. And we're mindful of the blood that he spilled on the cross. And we're mindful that that blood can wash our sins away through his willingness, through his love for us. 
Father, we're so thankful and as we partake of this fruit of the vine, may we do so in a way that glorifies him, glorifies you, and blesses you. And it's his name we pray. Amen. And it is our custom, we have opportunities to give of our means uh, to support the work of the church here in Northside, uh, here in Temple, Texas. Uh, there's several ways that you can contribute. Um, you can go to our website at www.northsidetemple.org and we have a tab there that you can click on to contribute online. Or if you would like, you can uh, mail your checks, uh, your contribution, to our address at Northside Church of Christ, 3401 North 3rd Street, Temple, Texas, 76501. And this way we can lay by in store as we're instructed to in the God's Word. Thank you so much.